Hello and welcome everyone. So in this lecture, I'm going to talk about basically the idea of nudges applied to uh, environmental issues. And so that's going to be the big idea here. I see this kind of as, I kind of see the value here is kind of twofold. Firstly, thinking about adding greater insight into what we mean by like Thaler's uh, idea of nudges and choice architects. And then also thinking about the sort of useful opportunity to apply in the context of environmental issues. There's a couple of videos here you click through. This is this is about producing uh, blue jeans. I think this is a, a video where we had like a river turning blue because of the dyes. And then here's a link to click through and see air pollution in China. It's like this really foggy, hazy, but it's like air pollution. The two papers that I'm going to be kind of thinking about is this first one, thinking about behavioral econ and climate change policy. And then secondly, um, uh, Sunstein and Reich thinking about automatically green uh, behavioral economics and environmental protection. So remember Sunstein and Thaler had this had the paper uh, thinking about uh, introducing idea of libertarian paternalism and the kind of that paper kind of applies similar things. All right, so the idea in this paper is saying is saying, well, um, we realize applications of behavioral economics to create greater value in terms of our modeling of real human behavior. And just kind of realizing a bunch of applications. So from the standpoint of the ultimatum game, public goods game, uh, we see there's a lot of regularities in human behavior, such as loss aversion, habituation, pure altruism, altruistic punishment, hyperbolic discounting in the future thinking about things that have applications to behavioral economics that are being drawn out in these kind of simple, relatively simple game forms. So ultimatum game and public goods game. Then the idea here is thinking about like applying behavioral economics now to uh, climate policy. Uh, so in this paper, they identified an issue of behavioral economics literature being, well, thinking about examples of non-rational behavior as anomalies. And that is definitely true of like some of the really early behavioral economic uh, uh, papers. And so um, here, thinking about like how people are kind of thinking about these interesting failings relative to the standard model, uh, you might think of irrational behavior as this sort of tug of war between the rational part of the brain and the emotional part with the implication that humans try to act rationally but are dragged down by animal instincts. Um, my view is, I'm not sure this is the most charitable reading possible for recent behavioral economics work. Behavioral econ has developed into a tool for analysis more recently and we're thinking about uh, we're thinking about using this as a richer way to model behavior, but it's, I think it's not, an, it's not a totally unreasonable reading for like the early treatment of behavioral econ. Anyway, so in this, in this particular paper, they're arguing, uh, we could take the idea of, um, we take the idea of behavioral economics and try to come up with um, this interesting policy framework that will be workable for collections of large groups of humans. Interestingly, we see, well, climate change is an example of how policies can be informed by theories of human choice and maybe ought to be because it's kind of a really massive, uh, sort of a really massive question. Thinking about, well, exactly what's happening, what's the human role, what ought humans do, if anything, about what we see happening in terms of climate trends. All right, so importantly, we want to we say, well, uh, it's important to understand how people are making decisions, how they respond to incentives. And it's much more than just an interesting scientific question, interesting from the standpoint of like econ researchers. It's It also might be really crucial if we're really interested in coming up with policy that could have impacts on, on human survival. Now, I think that's true, rel you know, here in this paper, they're viewing like the key existential threat being climate change, but there's a lot of other things that could kind of end human survival on this planet. And so there's a lot of interesting kind of, a lot of room for interesting applications of behavioral econ to create good policy uh, for, you know, for the benefit of uh, future generations. All right, so uh, the, the idea here central in the paper is, well, it's likely that responding to rapid climate change will be the major challenge that are faced by humans in the coming decades. And observing the fact that carbon dioxide levels are higher than previously, uh, thinking about how econ economists so far have treated 
issues relating to climate change have focused on the allocation problem, coming up with, for instance, the most efficient way to allocate a given level of carbon emissions. And you can show actually that like something like a um, something like a cap and trade system is a really efficient way to reduce pollution. And the reason why is because, well, it it allows for specialization according to comparative advantage. You have those who can specialize in pollution abatement to do that. And this leads to the the smallest amount of uh, pollution given the given the circumstances. Anyway, so um, so let's see. The idea here is how to uh, so maybe the big issue is how to sharply reduce then eliminate carbon emissions, not how to theoretically allocate some given level of carbon. Um, interestingly, uh, we might I mean so we might argue that quantity limitations are actually the best abatement mechanism, but Okay, fine. So um, the important recognition in the paper is the idea that, well, uh, environmental problems involve a common good. We have potentially a tragedy, tragedy of the common situation. And behavioral econ shows that the social good can be undermined by the mere mention of money. Right? Money and monetary incentives and prices can contaminate some of the important intrinsic motivations that are important for people's motivation. And so uh, the, one of the reminders from the paper is, well, in contrast to the policy recommendations of most economists, actually relying on monetary incentives to tackle collective choice problems like global warming could actually have perverse effects. I do agree with that, actually, based on the, the realization that, yeah, I mean, money incentives can be effective, but at a really high cost sometimes. Like there's the, there's the question of whether we should pay children for, uh, for books that they read. And there's some clear benefits. There's also some clear costs. And one of the, one of the sort of main, uh, one of the main worries is that this would lead to a lack of intrinsic motivation. Similarly, we might have like a lack of intrinsic motivation and buy-in if it's only centering around monetary assumptions for climate policy as well. All right. So then, then in the paper, they consider like a number of different observations thinking about maybe coming up with a different way to to arrange economic organization globally so the first observation is well increasing consumption does not necessarily translate into increased social well-being and so the observation here is saying well increasing beyond a certain level of per capita income doesn't increase well-being uh, it's not the in terms of like standard of living in terms of like people's actually reported quality of life and well-being it's not entirely driven by consumption there's other really important things going on I mean, you could see that obviously in the, in like the individual labor market decision right you're trading off your time your time otherwise spent on leisure for wages and you don't choose to work all the time. That would be what's necessary to maximize the amount of income you bring in. But more than just income and more than just consumption matters, you also want experiences. You also want time. You want time to be able to relax, spend with friends and family. And so you might choose a lower level of consumption voluntarily and be happier for having done so. And that's actually kind of an application of that idea here. So we might think, well, let's, let's, reconfigure our welfare policy goals from income related to well-being related both in the developed world and in the developing world absolute income might be may not be correlated with uh, well-being but relative income might be right so people are very concerned about the relative position in society this concern may drive the pattern of consumption so policies to reduce consumption must be carefully formulated to minimize redistribution effects right well, anyway, I mean, so if we believe that it's not absolute income that matters, but it's relative income that motivates people, uh, think about the think about the arguments for reducing inequality and and for uh, and for uh, greater income equality. All right, so development need not mean increasing per capita consumption. That's interesting. So economic development need not mean increasing per capita consumption. Development in the third world need in, in the third world need not follow the path of the industrialized nation during the 20th century. I think that's actually right. I don't know that I necessarily agree with everything here, but the idea is like, um, so there, we have like what's considered the developed world and the developing world. And it would be, it would be, it would not be unreasonable to think that there could be a path of development that could have 
the developing world bypass a lot of the nasty things that the developed world previously went through and maybe reach a similar or better point on, on the other side. And that's sort of the idea. Um, also, the ability to cooperate with unrelated, unrelated species, unrelated others, is one of the almost unique characteristics of the human species. For most of our existence as a species, we lived in small groups in hostile environments where cooperation was essential to survival. Successfully dealing with the climate, global climate may require cooperation on an unprecedented scale. I think that's probably right. Uh, cooperation depends on the ability to punish free riders, and we worry about the question of fairness. So indeed, yeah, free riding is one of the main things that undermines cooperation because then it, dis it diminishes the incentives for those who otherwise would be cooperating to continue cooperating. Uh, and so that's, that's interesting. Um, okay. Real world cooperation depends on the specific context. Humans are unique to the, in the extent to which they cooperate, also unique in the extent to which they're willing to annihilate members of their own species. I mean, sadly, right? Um, experiments and observations show that people are more willing to cooperate with like others than outgroup persons. Um, more research in this area with an eye towards public policy implications is needed. All right, so anyway, so there's a lot of interesting observations, both kind of like thinking about human society more generally, thinking about what's necessary for cooperation, thinking about applications of behavioral economics. And I think this, my point always of mentioning this paper is just kind of bring us to the doorstep of saying, hey, look, behavioral economics might be useful in approaching this particular problem. Um, and actually any sort of collective action problem involving you know, large numbers of humans. Okay, so the next part I wanna do is now sort of shifting gears and focusing on the application of nudge and optimal or optimal paternalism ideas to environmental choices. So in this paper, automatically green behavioral icon and environmental protection, uh, the observation is, well, wise choice architecture might be a better mechanism for environmental protection than standard tools of economic incentives, mandates, and bans. So the idea is if we set up choice architecture, we mean like the environment that decision makers are reacting to. If we set this up carefully with the right status quo, the right opt-in, opt-out system, we could come up with a circumstance that ref that retains as much individual autonomy as possible, but at the same point, in the same time, leads us towards collectively the better outcome. All right, so the question, how did consumers choose between environmentally friendly products and services and alternatives that are potentially damaging? Well, the default rule might matter. Green defaults might be more... Uh, and, and so the default rule might matter. We see this from the optimal maternalism, optimal syntax nudge lecture. I, I cited the literature where it says that, that whatever was the status quo tends to persist. People tend not to revise. Like if you, whatever is the status quo and you have an opt out, people tend not to opt out. So the default rule that whatever people are enrolled into uh, or whatever happens if you make no choice tends to persist. And so that really might matter. Um, and then we worry a lot about, well, what's this going to cost? And so the green default could be more expensive or could be less expensive to consumers. And whichever of those is true really actually kind of matters for whether we want the green technology. All right, so now thinking beyond the incentives, well, suppose we have two sources of energy, green and gray. Suppose those choosing green emit lower levels of greenhouse gases and other pollutants, those using gray will save money. Which will consumers choose? Well, it depends on the magnitude of the relevant differences. Suppose green is far better on environmental grounds and gray costs only slightly less. Probably choose green, right? If so, consumers are more likely to choose green than if it's only slightly better on environmental grounds while gray costs way less, right? On the standard assumptions, people's incentives depends on the relationship between the economic incentives and the underlying preference. And I think actually this is really important for policymakers to reflect on and for us in general is thinking about, well, what's the cost and what's the benefit? All right, so behavioral economics suggests other things matter, such as prevailing social norms. What choice are others making? Social norms might tilt behavior towards green or gray, even when facing strong economic incentives. For instance, people's choices might involve signaling, such as cases of conspicuous conservation, right? So initially, like when the, when the Prius first came out, right, you've got Toyota Prius, you've got this energy efficient vehicle, you had kind of a lot of people pretty, pretty interested in, well, not only like being uh, being green, but also having 
people realize that they're green, right? So buying green is often done for status reasons. <laughs> Behaving green is often less vi visible and status laden, right? So if I drive around in a Prius and or if I have bumper sticker or whatever is the case, um, social media posts, like that's one thing, but then actually like turning off the lights and turning off the water while brushing your teeth or something like that. Um, it's really, really important. Like do you, so <laughs> there's like a super efficient, energy efficient, water efficient way to take a shower, which is like, turn the water on, turn the water off, soap up, turn the water on, rinse off and be done. That's not how most people take showers. And the question is like, you know, those who are behaving green versus those who are interested in being seen behaving or being being green. That that's that's interesting. We do that in kind of a lot of a lot of places. You know, what does it come down to? It's a difference between individual incentives and group incentives, right? Individually, if we were really interested in conserving water, everybody would shower exactly as I just described. Right? The problem is at the individual level, that isn't, it's not individually rational. There's much greater cost to the individual than to society at, at, at large. It's a social dilemma, right? And so that's actually something even apart from this, from this lecture that's interesting. All right, so default rules. Well, the defaults are the settings that apply or the outcomes that stick when the individuals don't actively change them. So suppose the choice architects set up a default rule, so automatically green, for instance, choose the green option, and then people are able to depart from it. They can opt out. Uh, so that would be an example of setting a default rule. Besides setting the default rule, well, choice architects might try to influence people's choices. So it might be the case that we don't set a default, we just require you to make a choice, and then we'll tell you all the good things and all the bad things on both sides. Hopefully, right? <laughs> Hopefully we tell you the good things and bad things on both sides. It could just be, well, we tell you all the good things on one side and all the bad things on the other side, and then you make your choice. So you can think really carefully about how this is actually implemented, how it's optimally implemented, and how you do it in a way to sort of respect, uh, respect individuals, right? All right, so here's the various combinations. So you could have active choosing plus self-conscious framing to encourage either green or gray. So this is active choosing means there's no status quo, there's no default. The default is you have to make a choice. You have to choose one way or the other plus self-conscious framing to encourage either the green or gray. So here, apart from the like environmental, suppose we were thinking about organ donations. This would be like when you get your driver's license, it's not the case that you're by default not an organ donor. It's not the, it's not the case that you're by default an organ donor, as some countries in Europe do. Instead, it's the case that you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice one or the other. Like you don't get your license until you make a choice. And then what we do is we tell you all the good things about being an organ donor. And so that would be an example of self-conscious framing, active choosing plus self-conscious framing. So in the case of like the green versus gray option, well, suppose there's like a, a pro-green default with a costly opt-out, costly in the sense of like high transaction cost. It could be the case of like either it's just annoying or it's bothersome to opt out or it could like actually cost you money. Maybe a pro-green default with a costless opt-out pro gray default with a costless opt out or pro gray default with a uh, with a costly costly opt out and the cost or costless it could either be the case of like you know here's this annoyance or this burden or it could be like a fine type of thing where like okay we really want you to use the green option we'll respect your choice not to but you're going to have to pay because you know we need to we need to offset whatever is this externality. You could think of a you could think of a story like that, and, and carefully. Like I'm not endorsing one way. I'm just saying like that's one way that this could this could play out in terms of costly either being in the sense of like monetary cost or it could be just in terms of your time. Like, you know, how easy is it to opt out? Can you do it yourself? Do you have to go through somebody else? These are all sort of like important things. And the important thing to reflect on then is which is appropriate given the search given the circumstances and the situation. Right. One big advantage to the green default is that these have beneficial effects while maintaining freedom of choice and hence respect for the fact that people are different. Right. The green default has beneficial effects because the green option is maybe what we'd want people to be doing anyway. And if people are able to opt out, then if they choose to do something differently, they have that ability. Uh, so question, what if the relevant population contains many people facing serious economic difficulty? What if green is more expensive um, 
and it, or if green is more expensive, we absolutely must allow them to opt out. Also, under those circumstances, realizing that people have the sort of status quo bias and it tends to like stay enrolled, it maybe you'd actually want to use a forced choice. You have to choose one way or the other rather than automatically enrolling people in the more expensive option, especially if it's substantially more expensive and you don't want people to even like accidentally pay more than they'd be able to, right? So there's some interesting issues there. Um, we already have a wide variety of green, gray, and in-between defaults kind of looking around society. And the observation from the paper is, well, these should be brought more careful, brought to more careful scrutiny. All right, so why is it the case that the default rules matter? Well, there's this implicit suggestion or endorsement contained in the default. So for instance, like if the default is something like double-sided printing on the printer at the university, or using green energy, people might think that experts have deemed this to be the right course of action and therefore more likely to follow that lead. So it might not be the case that people don't want to disenroll because they're lazy or don't care. It might be the case that they think, oh, well, if this is the status quo. This is what we ought to be doing. Uh, there's the issue of inertia. To change the default requires effort. People have a tendency towards status quo and towards procrastination. You have to realize that people have inertia and you know, I don't know, that can definitely be used to help people make, continue to make the better choice. On the other hand, I, you know, I think, at least in my mind, realizing that if people, I don't know, so if people want to make a different choice, we, I think we kind of want to allow them to make the different choice, even if we realize that they've got this inertia towards not changing. That's why I, I, other things equal, I like the idea whenever it's feasible to just require a choice, that way people have made their selection and you know that it's been consciously chosen and not by accident or due to lack of information or awareness. The reference points and loss aversion is important, why the default rule matters, because people dislike losses far more than they like corresponding gains, right? The default actually is what's determining what's counting as a loss and what's counting as a gain. Therefore, the default rule is going to really matter relative to creating the reference point and then activating any type of loss aversion. What's the conclusion? Well, if choice architects have a reason to be confident about the preferred default, they should select it. But if the assessment's really difficult and their suppose their judgment's actually highly tentative, we don't know if this is the right course of action or not, then they should rely on active choosing, especially if the externalities are not large. So for instance, force consumers to choose green or gray for themselves. And that's interesting as well because depending on what the choice is, this is actually a way, right? If if their judgment is highly tentative, like we don't have all the information, so rely, rely on active choosing if the externalities are not large, forcing people to choose actually is kind of a way to crowdsource a little bit of the, the wisdom of crowds on this decision actually. So I like that for a couple of reasons. Firstly, well, let's not force people into a default if we're not sure that that's the right one or if it's more costly. Also, we actually learn from observing people's choices in the aggregate. Uh, also, well, green defaults are easy to justify when the sim simultaneous when they simultaneously save money and protect the environment, right? So if this is something that's like just better on two grounds, from the standpoint of being better for the environment as well as being better for people's own budget, then it's really easy to justify. Double-sided printing, so on and so forth. In other cases, the green defaults might be more costly, like smart grid, smart meters, but have benefits. Um, but then costs like traceability and re reduce privacy. Privacy is something really interesting, especially relative to this course to then talk about. What's the basic point? Well, in important context, outcomes are harmful to the environment and to the economy, um, not because of an active choice by consumers um, to impose these harms, but because of the relevant choice architecture. So we want to think carefully about the choice architecture, the way that this, the way that the environment, the way that the situation, the context within people are choosing has been set up. So the idea, like once again, so what, what do we mean by choice architect? We just mean by like who's setting, who's setting up the environment? How is this being created? How is the how is the scenario that I'm reacting to? How did that come come to be? Somebody's made a choice at some at some level, whether it's been actively thought about and designed or not, whatever is the default. So we want to think carefully about like what is this larger context that people are choosing within. And take that seriously, realizing that the status quo really matters and whether people are able to opt in or opt out really matters. And then coming up with the with the configuration that's gonna be the best from the standpoint of the individuals as well as the as as well as uh, society more generally. I think that's a really important observation and a really important thing to to recognize that 
the decisions we make about the context within which people are choosing really have significance. That's important at the policy level. Interestingly, so I mean this to introduce and to reinforce the idea of nudge and then in this sort of uh, sort of hopefully compelling example, but we see this from the standpoint of businesses as well, right? And you see this, it's, it's interesting at, at the firm level, configuring a store, like where you put, where you put um, displays and, and what's by the checkout and what's on a website, what do you see first, how easy it is to, to add things to your cart or checkout or whatever. Like all these things really matter and there's a choice architect behind it, whether we kind of use that language or not. It's important to, re to reflect on some interesting applications there and hopefully gives you something to kind of think about as we uh, go ahead and conclude here. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.